This is BBC One in the South East. Now, the news at 10 o'clock with Peter Sissons and Mike Embley. The House of Commons has elected a new Speaker, but not without controversy. Glasgow Labour MP Michael Martin took the chair within the last hour. Struck off the anaesthetist whose bungling led to a young boy's death. Rail track gets billions more for safety and a warning to make it count. And diplomacy's last frontier. America's Secretary of State lets her hair down in North Korea. Here in the southeast, the human cost of a colossal hole in a council budget. Parents bed down to save schools from closure. Will cancellations, delays and overcrowding cost Connex its franchise? Good evening. From a long list of contenders and after hours of speeches and voting, MPs tonight filled the shoes of Betty Boothroyd. The next Speaker of the House of Commons is Michael Martin, one of her former deputies, and like her, drawn from the Labour ranks. One by one, he saw off his challenges, with Conservative and Liberal Democrat candidates being voted down. Many members seemed unhappy with that break with tradition, and some with the entire day's procedure. In a bad-tempered final vote, there were many abstentions on the opposition benches. From Westminster, our political editor, Andrew Marr. He might look coy, dragged to the chair tonight, but he's fought for this moment from the day Betty Boothroyd said she was going. Michael Martin, a former sheet metal worker from Glasgow, becomes the first Catholic Speaker of the Commons since the Reformation. A fixer championed by the mass ranks of Labour backbenchers, not the establishment man, he won easily, despite appeals to look beyond party. His beaten rivals included former Tory minister Sir George Young, the Lib Dems, Mingus Campbell, and Labour veteran Gwyneth Dunwoody. But it only happened after a vicious row over the incredibly complicated voting system, which has left a poisonous atmosphere in the Commons tonight. The father of the House, the most senior MP, Sir Edward Heath, was in charge and bombarded by MPs pleading for an ordinary, straightforward ballot. The Commons was becoming irrelevant and making itself look stupid. We've been in recess since July. There's been a fuel crisis, there's been a Danish no, the collapse of the euro, a war in the Middle East, and what is our business tomorrow? Insolvency Bill Lords. A matter of fact, it ought to be called Bankruptcy Bill Commons. As we should be a model of democracy, can we not at this moment choose a democratic procedure for the election yeah. of the Speaker? The order in which the candidates were chosen was crucial, but Father Ted was in no mood for explanations. By what criteria were the sequence of these names decided? They were done at my discretion. <laughs> so Sir Edward rumbled on. All afternoon, all evening, candidates were put up. Clear the lobby. And knocked down again. Clear the lobby. Clear the lobby. And again. Clear the lobby. And again, 11 times in all. Clear the lobbies. And when they finally staggered out of the lobbies, this seven-hour game of parliamentary knockout left many MPs angry, even humiliated. This was a Byzantine form of election. It was meaningless to most of the people who participated in it. And if it's meaningless to them, it'll be uh, even more uh, meaningless to the people outside. And it's they who count. And that's why this has been a bad day for the House of Commons. To the victor, however, the spoils. Should, Mr Martin had the votes, now he has the harder this. job of healing wounds and convincing MPs he's everyone's speaker, and not only Labour's. Andrew Marr, BBC and News, Westminster. And Andrew Marr joins us now from Westminster. Andrew, you referred in that report to a poisonous atmosphere in the House tonight. Is that because Labour MPs were not taken with the idea of voting for a Tory or a Liberal Democrat? Yes, I think really what happened was that Labour's great army of lobby fodder, all those people who came in in 97 and who are disregarded, they feel, by their own government, can't stand the Conservatives, decided they were going to have one of their own. Um, but in doing so, of course, they've infuriated the Conservative uh, MPs as well. And one of them said to me just now, we are going to make Speaker Martin's life a misery. So what is life going to be like in practical terms for the new Speaker if they're as good as their word? 
Well, he's going to have to reach out to a lot of people who feel that this was um, a very, very unfair and unfortunate way of doing things and want something different in future. He's going to have to give the opposition plenty of uh, opportunities for debate, plenty of questions, and in doing so, of course, he'll anger his own side. So it's going to be a, a, a very rough ride for him, I think. But this was probably inevitable, given the way that the election was set up today. And can they do it this way in the future? I don't think they will ever go through this again. It has been a very bad day for the Commons. It's left a lot of bitterness. This is meant to end with a vote of acclamation. Everyone's supposed to say, yes, this is the speaker we want. There was so much bitterness, they had to go to a vote. That's unprecedented. Andrew Marr, thank you. An anaesthetist has been struck. Did you know how easy it is to watch almost all your favourite BBC programmes with subtitles? From award-winning drama and comedy to films, sports coverage, the local and national news, and from November, even live and kicking. You can find subtitles for all sorts of programmes on CFAX page 888. Or if you're a digital viewer, simply select subtitles from the menu. Log on to bbc.co.uk slash info for more details. Newsnight now on BBC Two with Kirsty Walk. Westminster chooses a speaker by one man's rules. They were done at my discretion. That was Heath without Robinson. Is this any way to run a democracy? Good evening. Michael Martin is tonight following in Betty Boothroyd's high heels. The ceremony in which he's dragged supposedly reluctantly to the Speaker's chair has unintended irony, given 11 others also wanted the job. Wouldn't a ballot be more dignified than it's a knockout? Also tonight, is it predictable that asylum seekers and immigrants get such a hard time, given the scale of ignorance in Britain about immigration? and the search for truth in Kosovo. Something has exploded yeah. the skull, it's gone into pieces. An extraordinary insight into the disturbing and harrowing work carried out by a British forensic team daily as they gather evidence on war crimes. First tonight, the mad parliament. That's surprisingly not the description of the carry-on this afternoon at Westminster, but of the first parliament presided over by someone approximating to a speaker in the year 1258, so no change there. MPs crammed into the chamber for the election of the 21st century speaker, with candidates pledged, to one degree or another, to modernisation. They scattered around words like flummery and arcane to describe the machinations of the house. But to watch 659 grown-ups, paid from the public purse, fail to agree a fair way to elect arguably the most powerful position in the chamber, saving that of the Prime Minister, brings to mind words like bizarre, shambolic and absurd. Laura Trevelyan was watching. It was back to school for MPs today after their lengthy summer recess. And the first task of the autumn term was to elect a new speaker. In keeping with the old school traditions of the place, candidates aren't even meant to say they want the job. But in an attempt to democratise the process, hustings were held today. More than 120 MPs piled into committee room 10 this morning, with its views overlooking the River Thames, to hear most of the candidates for speaker set out their stall. The only problem was, most of the front runners weren't there, thinking it was rather undignified to go along. It was, one Labour MP told me, just like public school people shouting and banging on the tables. But then he added, we are electing a new head of house. May I support the... Despite concern about the complicated nature of the election, the man conducting it, the father of the house, Sir Edward Heath, refused to bow to pressure to allow a straight ballot of all the 12 candidates. I believe we would become very confused if we tried to change the rules in the middle of our, our period now. <laughs> not what they wanted to hear. Sir Edward made a concession and did announce the order MPs would vote on the candidates, but the mood of the House appeared to swing heavily against him. On what basis and by what criteria were the sequence of these names decided? You say you have discretion. Indeed, you do have discretion. And that is what's wrong with this entire system of election. It should be, it should be opened 
They should be transparent, and people here and outside should be able to understand it. MPs are so exercised about the election of the Speaker because of the importance of the role. The Speaker is responsible for conducting debates, for keeping MPs in order, for reading the mood of the House, and for standing up for the rights of backbench MPs against what's often seen as an overpowerful executive. Brussels. I've been on the the impassioned case for a strong speaker was made to the packed Minister house by Tony Benn, the man who tried desperately to change the rules. There, there's been a fuel crisis, there's been a Danish no, the collapse of the euro, a war in the Middle East, and what is our business tomorrow? Insolvency bill lords. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it ought to be called Bankruptcy Bill Commons, because we simply don't play a role. The minutes tick by as MPs changing the process to no avail. It was on with the election, and the Labour MP and bookie's favourite Michael Martin made this plea for the job. I have never sought to be a whip, a front bench spokesman or a government minister. Quite right. <laughs> But come to think of it, no one ever invited me to take it. A bizarre series of votes followed, right, but each time Mr Martin won through. To the left, 345. Well, it's five past five and they've been going since half past two. And so far they've voted on four out of the 12 candidates. I've just come from the parliamentary press gallery, where the consensus is that Michael Martin is probably going to get it. But MPs are voting now on Sir George Young candidate who's reckoned to have the best chance of defeating Michael Martin. For my 26 years I have been in the Conservative Party, but to repeat a familiar phase, phrase, not run by the Conservative Party. <laughs> Sir George Young, the former Tory Cabinet Minister, made what many judged to be the best speech of the day, but he didn't get enough votes. And at 9.21 tonight, Michael Martin was finally declared the winner. <laughs> Outsiders found the whole process most peculiar. It seems like a museum. I mean, I, I served in it for 32 years. I, I love the traditions and all the rest of it. When you come back and look at it from the outside, it does seem a bit antiquated, yes. We've had this crazy process where candidates have emerged and you've had to second guess which way your neighbour's likely to vote. It's very, very unsatisfactory and I think it does Parliament and modern democracy no favours at all. It's no wonder that politics is, is looked upon with disdain, particularly by the younger generation. So who exactly is the 156th Speaker? The Glaswegian Mr Martin is a former sheet metal worker and trade unionist, an MP for 21 years. Despite all the younger Labour MPs wanting to modernise the House of Commons and change the hours, they haven't exactly voted for a radical. He's very much old Labour, Glaswegian, Catholic working class. He's a man of very strong principles. Um, as a Catholic, he's anti-abortion. Uh, against early gay sex and the way in which his vote has held shows that he's been cultivating the whole of the Parliamentary Labour Party. Convention dictated Mr Martin was dragged to the Speaker's chair by MPs tonight looking reluctant. That reluctance extended to a number of Labour ministers who voted for Sir George Young instead. It's been an eventful first day back and MPs are hoping Mr Martin's reign of Speaker will be an improvement on his election. Lord Trevelyan, well I'm joined now by two backbenchers at Westminster, by Gordon Prentice and also by Crispin Blunt. First of all, uh, Gordon Prentice, um, we may joke about this, but tonight do you think the uh, esteem in which the Commons is held is up or down? Well, you called it a mad parliament, Kirsty. I don't think it was a parliamentary uh, pantomime, but what is clear Things will never be the same again. Uh, there is pressure for change. It didn't happen this time, but we're not going to go through this performance for the election of the next speaker. And I'm sure within the next uh, few weeks, the Modernisation Committee or the Procedure Committee will really roll up its sleeves and get down to work to make sure we don't go through this again. Do you know that's going to happen? No, I don't, but uh, had there been a vote today, if uh, Ted Heath had allowed a vote, we would have had a different method of election. Uh, now, you saw the video, I was there, and it was a travesty that we weren't allowed an election. Now, I, I organised hustings in the morning, and there were about uh, 150 people there, your report said 120, and there was one dissenting voice. All the other members well, there wanted a ballot. Let's bring Crispin Brunton. Do you think it was a travesty that you weren't allowed to vote on the method in which you would actually vote for the Speaker? 
I think it was a great pity because it has undermined um, Mr. Speaker Martin from the very beginning. The point I wanted to make was that Mr. Speaker Martin, simply by virtue of being the first candidate on Sir Edward Heath's list, was then, we were then expected to receive him as a coronation, everybody having made individual votes on the merits of the other candidates but it was, but available. Yeah, and the thing was that it was Sir Edward Heath that decided he would be first on the list. It was absolutely up to the discretion of Sir Edward, as the father of the House. But does it not seem extraordinary to the public looking in that the majority of MPs in the House was very definitely against this method of crowning of the Speaker, and yet you could do nothing about it. It made Westminster look completely impotent. Do you well, think so? Still, well, there still would have been something we could have done about it. I, I agree with Gordon Prentice, and it would have been far, far better had we been able to change the method of election, which is why I gave my support to Tony Benn in the proposal he made. But the, at the end of the day, when the v vote came on Michael Martin, instead of treating it as a coronation, we should have treated him in exactly the same way as we treated all other 11 candidates. And then we should have voted on uh, his but, merits in exactly the same way as we've done with the, the others. It's extraordinary that you two are elected uh, representatives. You're at Westminster. Both of you are complaining, but it seemed that nobody had any as well, wherewithal to make any impact on the voting and now we have a speaker who's been elected by a quite bizarre way considering there were 11 other candidates. Well that's not quite, it's not quite true. The uh, procedure committee looked at this in 1996 and in Westminster terms that's very recent, bizarre as that may seem. Uh, but it was clear to me back in July when Betty Boothroyd said that she was going to resign and almost immediately about five or six candidates threw the hat into the ring uh, that we had to look anew at the method of election and over the summer additional candidates uh, joined the race and today we were faced with a field 12 strong. It was completely unprecedented. But it wasn't but without the bounds of possibility that someone would devise a system which to take care of that. Let me, let me just mm. move on to talk about the traditions. Is it, you know, David Steele talks about looking back in Westminster and how he thinks the whole thing is quite, you know, bizarre, uh, looking at it as it were from the Scottish parliamentary perspective. But do you think it is worth upholding some of the traditions of the place? I mean, even such as the Speaker being escorted by kind of four different... Is in the traditions are important because they're part of the continuity of Parliament. What we politicians have got to do, what we parliamentarians have got to do, is to take back some power from the executive. And I think we are now part of that protest, pro process. Gordon Prentice was a very important part of forcing a free vote on the government about uh, the, the, the liaison committee's proposals for making select committees much more independent. Uh, and taking away some of the influence of the executive. But the fact and we're is, part the, of that process now. But, yeah, but, can the I fact is, uh, but with such a whopping great majority, it simply looks to the public as if all that Westminster does is rubber stamp well, the legislation. Up to, it's, it is up to primarily the backbenchers of the government party to show their independence. Will you, and, will you Gordon Prentice, show your independence? Well, yeah, I think you're completely missing the point. You know, any talk about wigs and stockings and uh, parliamentary pantomimes are missing the point. The mm. real question is the relationship of parliament Absolutely. to the government. And George now, Young now, said, now, to, George to, Young said today that he was like a buckle and he was trying to put the buckle which had come apart together again, which was the people yes. and the executive. Yes. But how does a speaker put the buckle back together again? Well, I'm a Labour member. I want to see the return of a Labour government, but it doesn't help that to have a supine parliament. It just makes me cringe. Mm. And we want a strong parliament and we want a determined speaker to hold the government to account. And as far as I'm concerned, it's a win-win situation. The government wins and parliament wins. Today, do, do you think that uh, MPs at Westminster look as if they're very embarrassed? Is that a question to me, Kirsty? It's a question to both of you. Well, no, we always knew this was a difficult uh, day to get through, but uh, I take comfort from the fact that it didn't collapse into chaos. That was always a, a, a possibility, and we're going to put this behind us and make sure it doesn't happen again. Was it an I, embarrassment? I, I, re I regret that the answer to that question is yes. Mm. And Mr Speaker Martin now has a big job to do to establish his authority and to establish the authority of the House of Commons as against the executive. And if we can't do that, then we're going to be in big trouble. Gentlemen, thank you both very much indeed. Mythology is a powerful force.